Justice Scalia also has our opinion this morning in case 07290, District of Columbia versus Heller. If you can bear with me, I, I can do it. Um, this case is here on writ of certiorari to the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. District of Columbia law bans handgun possession by making it a crime to carry an unregistered firearm prohibiting the registration of handguns and providing separately that no person may carry a handgun not licensed by the chief of police who is authorized to issue one-year licenses. In addition, it requires residents to keep lawfully owned firearms, which would include long guns, unloaded and disassembled or bound by a trigger lock or similar device. Respondent Heller, a D.C. special policeman, applied to register a handgun he wished to keep at home, but the district refused. He filed this suit seeking on Second Amendment grounds to enjoin the city from enforcing the ban on handgun registration, the licensing requirement insofar as it prohibits carrying an unlicensed firearm in the home, and the trigger lock requirement insofar as it pro prohibits the use of functional firearms in the home. The District Court dismissed the suit, but the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit reversed, holding that the Second Amendment protects an individual's right to possess firearms and that the city's total ban on handguns, as well as its requirement that firearms in the home be kept non-functional, even when necessary for self-defense, violated this right. The Court of Appeals directed the District Court to enter summary judgment for respondent. In an opinion filed with the clerk today, we affirm the judgment of the District of Columbia Circuit. We hold that the Second Amendment guarantees an individual right to have and use arms for self-defense in the home, and that the district's handgun ban, as well as its requirement that firearms in the home be rendered inoperative, violates that right. Our opinion is very lengthy, examining in detail the text and history of the Second Amendment. This summary that I'm giving will state little more than the conclusions. If you want to check their validity against the dissent's contrary claims, you will have to read some 154 pages of opinions. The Second Amendment provides, quote, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. The interpretive difficulty and what causes some people to think that it confers only a collective rather than an individual right, and others, including the petitioners here, to think that it is an individual right, but only to keep and bear arms for service in a militia, uh, the interpretive difficulty that produces those uh, positions is, of course, the prologue, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. It's a standard principle of interpretation, and was in 1791, that a prologue cannot limit the scope of the operative text, which often goes beyond the narrow purpose set forth in a prologue. It would be peculiar, however, for the prologue positively to contradict the text. So we examine first the operative portion of the amendment, namely, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. We conclude after examining many uses of keep arms and bear arms contemporaneous with and prior to the adoption of the Second Amendment that it means pretty much what it means today, to have and carry weapons. Those old sources refute the notion that bear arms alone or keep and bear arms in combination has an exclusively military connotation. To be sure, when one was a soldier, he bore arms, but one could bear arms without being a soldier. The same conclusion that the phrase does not refer to military service is demanded by the fact that it was universally understood that the Second Amendment incorporated into the Federal Constitution a pre-existing right of Englishmen set forth in the 1689 English Bill of Rights. That's why it reads, shall not be infringed. The right shall not be infringed, referring to a pre-existing right. And everybody agrees with that. There is no doubt that the English right was an individual right to have and carry arms. We then turn to the prologue to see if it is incompatible with the interpretation we have given the operative clause. It is not. In fact, that interpretation achieves the object of the prologue more effectively 
than would a mere right to have and bear arms in an organized militia. The militia consisted of all male citizens capable of military service. That was thought to be a protection against not only attack from abroad, but tyranny at home. In the events that had given rise to the English Bill of Rights, the Stuart kings had not abolished the people's militia, but had simply taken away uh, the people's arms or the arms of their opponents, leaving in place only a standing army and a select militia dominated by their own supporters. The lesson learned, if the people cannot have arms, there will be no people's militia. That perception is what joins the two, part of the two parts of the Second Amendment. The mere right to keep and bear arms in a state-organized militia does not solve the problem, because the state could, like the Stuart kings, limit the organized militia to its own people. So what the Second Amendment means is, since we need a people's militia, the people will not be deprived of the right to keep and bear arms. This interpretation is confirmed by analogous arms-bearing rights in state constitutions that preceded and immediately followed the adoption of the Second Amendment. Of the four states that had analogs to the Federal Second Amendment before the Constitution was ratified, two clearly conferred individual rights unconnected to militia service, specifying the people's right to bear arms for their own defense. And the most likely reading is that the other two also secured an individual right to bear arms for defensive purposes. Similarly, of the nine states, uh, of the nine state analogs to the Second Amendment that were adopted between 1789 and 1820, seven referred to the people's right to bear arms in defense of themselves and the state or to the citizen's right to bear arms in defense of himself and the state. The final two of, of, those nine, uh, of those nine were ambiguous, but were interpreted by the state courts to confer an individual right to bear arms for lawful purposes. Our opinion then looks at legal interpretations of the Second Amendment from immediately after its ratification through the 19th century. We find that scholars, including the most famous ones, Tucker, Rawls, Story, and Cooley, the adjudicated cases, Congressional legislation and the statements of congressional legislators universally took the right to be a personal one, unconnected to militia service. The one exception is a minor scholar who acknowledged that his view had been rejected. As one might expect, after the Civil War, the right of the former slaves and new freemen to bear arms was a significant issue. Let me read from a joint congressional report dated 1866. In some parts of South Carolina, armed parties are, without proper authority, engaged in seizing all firearms found in the hands of freemen. Such conduct is in clear and direct violation of their personal rights as guaranteed by the Constitution of the United States, which declares that the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. The Congressional Act creating the Freedmen's Bureau on July 16, 1866, stated the right to have full and equal benefit of all laws and proceedings concerning personal liberty and personal security, including the constitutional right to bear arms, shall be secured to and enjoyed by all the citizens without respect to race or color or previous condition of slavery. It was good to have a gun when, 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 when the Klansmen came. Our opinion next turns to whether any prior decisions of this Court preclude the interpretation we have just described. We conclude that none does. I will only describe one of those cases on which the dissent places its principal reliance. That is our decision in United States versus Miller, rendered in 1939. The judgment in that case upheld against a Second Amendment challenge two men's federal convictions for transporting an unregistered sawed-off shotgun in interstate commerce in violation of the National Firearms Act. It is entirely clear that the Court's basis for saying that the Second Amendment did not prevent the conviction was not that the defendants were bearing arms privately rather than in a militia. Rather, it was that the type of weapon at issue was not eligible for Second Amendment protection. 
quote, in the absence of any evidence tending to show that the possession or use of a short-barreled shotgun at this time has some reasonable relationship to the preservation or efficiency of a well-regulated militia, we cannot say that the Second Amendment guarantees the right to keep and bear such an instrument, close quote. Certainly, the Court continued, it is not within judicial notice that this weapon is any part of the ordinary military equipment or that its use could contribute to the common defense, close quote. Beyond that, (coughs) the opinion provided no explanation of the content of the right to keep and bear arms. This holding is not only consistent with but positively suggests that the Second Amendment confers a right to keep and bear arms for lawful private purposes. Had the Court believed that the Second Amendment protects only those uh, those serving in the militia, (coughs) it would have been odd to examine the character of the weapon rather than simply note that the two crooks were not militiamen. Miller stands only for the proposition that the Second Amendment right, whatever its nature, extends only to certain types of weapons. It is particularly wrong-headed to read Miller for more than what it said, because the case did not even purport to be a thorough examination of the Second Amendment. The respondent made no appearance in the case, neither filing a brief nor appearing at oral argument. The Court heard from no one but the government. Reason enough, one would think, not to make that case the beginning and the end of this Court's consideration of the Second Amendment. The government's Miller brief provided scant discussion of the history of the Second Amendment, and the Court was presented with no counter-discussion. As for the text of the Court's opinion, that, uh, as for the text of the Court's opinion itself, that discusses none of the history of the Second Amendment. It assumes from the prologue that the amendment was designed to preserve the militia, which we do not dispute, and then reviews some historical materials dealing with the nature of the militia and, in particular, with the nature of the arms their members were expected to possess. Not a word, not a word about the history of the Second Amendment. The next section of our opinion points out that, like most rights, the Second Amendment right is not unlimited. It is not a right to keep and carry any weapon weapon whatsoever, in any manner whatsoever, and for whatever purpose. For example, concealed weapons prohibitions have been upheld under the amendment or state analogs. Our opinion should not be taken to cast doubt on long-standing prohibitions on the possession of firearms by felons and the mentally ill, or laws forbidding the carrying of firearms in sensitive places such as schools and government buildings, or laws imposing conditions and qualifications on the commercial sale of arms. Miller's holding that the sorts of weapons protected are those, quote, in common use at the time, close quote, finds support in the historical tradition of prohibiting the carrying of dangerous and unusual weapons. We make no attempt to provide and no excuse for not providing extensive historical justification for those regulations of the right that we describe as permissible. Since this case represents the Court's first in-depth examination of the Second Amendment, one should not expect it to clarify the entire field. There will be time enough uh, to expound upon the historical justifications for these exceptions we have mentioned, if and when those exceptions come before us. Finally, we come to our disposition of the case. The district's handgun ban and the trigger lock requirement, at least as applied to immediate self-defense, which is all that respondent asked for, violate the Second Amendment. The district's total ban on handgun possession in the home amounts to a prohibition of of an entire class of arms that Americans overwhelmingly choose for the lawful purpose of self-defense. Under any of the standards of scrutiny the Court has applied to enumerated constitutional rights, this prohibition, in the place where the need for lawful defense of self, family, and property is most acute, would fail constitutional muster. Similarly, the requirement that any lawful firearm in the home be disassembled or bound by a trigger lock makes it impossible for citizens to use arms for the core lawful purpose of self-defense and is hence unconstitutional. Because Heller conceded at oral argument that the D.C. licensing law is permissible if it is not enforced arbitrarily and capriciously, the Court assumes that a license will satisfy his prayer for release for relief, and so we do not address the licensing requirement. Assuming he is not disqualified from exercising Second Amendment rights, uh, 
by being a felon or, or mentally ill, for example, the district must permit Heller to register his handgun and must issue him a license to carry it at home. We are aware of the problem of handgun violence in this country, and we take seriously the concerns raised by the many amici who believe that prohibition of handgun ownership is a solution. The Constitution leaves the District of Columbia a variety of tools for combating that problem, including some measures regulating handguns. But the Second Amendment necessarily takes certain policy choices off the table. These include the absolute prohibition of handguns held and used for self-defense in the home. Undoubtedly, some think that the Second Amendment is outmoded in a society where our standing army is the pride of our nation, where well-trained police forces provide personal security, and where gun violence is a serious problem. That is perhaps debatable. But what is not debatable is that it is not the role of this Court to pronounce the Second Amendment extinct. The judgment of the Court of Appeals is affirmed. Justice Stevens has filed a dissenting opinion in which Justices Souter, Ginsburg, and Breyer have joined. Justice Breyer has filed a dissenting opinion in which Justices Stevens, Souter, and Ginsburg have joined.